Hey there, you're listening to Making Spaces, the podcast about community, culture, and making new connections, hosted by my good Judy, my friend and yours, Sarah Heath. On this podcast, we're having conversations about design, literally making spaces, and how some of the most inclusive spaces aren't always the most inviting. And we're talking about what it means to make space for one another. With the world the way it is right now, we need to find ways to have conversations across lines of radical difference. So join Sarah each week as she tackles the intersection of design and practical spirituality with conversations with some of the most fabulous guests you're ever going to meet. Some will talk about actual design. Some of us will talk about relational design. But no matter what, it's an incredible time. So grab yourself a cup of whatever you like, and welcome to Making Spaces with Sarah Heath. The division is the first step, yeah. and I think it's important not to discount that vision and just say it's too hard or it'll take too long or there's no way, rather than discount it, to really look at if we pull together all of our people and our resources, I bet we can do that. Welcome to the first ever episode of Making Spaces, the podcast, Maker's Edition, which is where I'm going to be talking about something that actually has to do with practical design or fixing something or something that sort of requires some visuals. And so if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do. You can find it by looking me up, Rev Sarah Heath or Sarah Heath or Making Spaces. We have to get over 100 folks subscribed and we just started putting videos up. So as soon as we get 100 folks subscribed, then we can actually have a name that has our stuff in it. But this is going to be really different and I hope my sound editor isn't so mad at me because we're doing an actual visual element. So there's a video that we're filming right now and then we're also recording the podcast using our microphone right here. And so these episodes are going to be shorter but describe physical things and so there's going to be pictures that I'm going to be showing. Sometimes I'll be in a space um, but today you know, that a space that we're flipping over. But today I'm actually in my home office because we are still sheltering in place. It is really hot. And so please excuse my sweating. For those of you who are just listening, um, please excuse the idea of me sweating. So as we talk about today's topic, we're gonna talk about cues. One of the things that caused just sort of a, a flurry of activity on my social media was when I posted pictures of what we ended up doing to solve our pew problem. What was our pew problem? Well, we had these really big, beautiful pews that I noticed when I first walked in the church. They're absolutely gorgeous. They're built in the 1920s, the same time as the building. And so these gorgeous pews were built in place. They were bolted into the floor and they were bolted into the flooring that there was six different kinds of flooring. Um, and so there's big, beautiful pews. People love them for weddings. But the problem is, is that we only had that one room. And as I'm always trying to say for making spaces, when you are transforming a space, please think about the different ways it can be used. Don't just think about it as, okay, we're only going to use it for church because if there, or we're only going to use it for this gathering, or I'm only going to use this part of my home for whatever it might be. Multi-purpose space is the way to go. So as we talked about what we wanted to be as a community, we knew that we wanted to face each other. So the pews we're going to have to be mobile. It took me about a year to come up with some sort of way. Um, and I, I had to like go on all kinds of Google searches. And I, I found that there were a bunch of churches in England that were using their buildings to rent them out for um, different functions. And they were using casters. Well, casters on this was an idea, but I thought the pews were way too big. So my first idea was that I was going to make the pews smaller, but then that was just going to cost us so much money. We also could have taken the pews out, but then we would have had to put chairs in and chairs that are like actually attractive are quite expensive. And so we thought through this and it took us a while and we ended up coming up with the idea of using the casters that you put on the bottom of toolboxes because they are able to hold so much weight. And we actually found some great ones and we were starting to put them in. And let me tell you, I got them in and we realized that the pews themselves as we were moving them, because they were so old, the center pieces were starting to get warped and they had actually been warped over time. So once we got the flooring in, and we're able to move the pews around. By the way, we had to put some of the pews up into the second story. These pews are so long, there was only one way to get them up, which is that we had to have people hoist them up over the balcony, which was 
incredible and insane. And I have some photos of that. I can't believe that we ever did it, but we, we did that. We put some of the pews up cause we wanted to have enough space. Cause apparently people are taller now, I guess, but we needed more space than they did in the 1920s. Same thing with the fact that we only have two bathrooms for that many people. I don't think people use the bathroom in the 1920s. Um, but this space, knowing that we wanted to use it multi-purpose and we didn't want to put the cat, like put the pews back down, we decided to use locking casters. Again, the casters, because we're thinking about the most people that can actually move the, the pews as well, we wanted to make sure that anybody who volunteered was going to be able to do it. So locking casters was the answer for us. Also trying to get it as cheap as we could, but knowing that we wanted to last as long as we could. And those center brackets in our pews, because they were so long, had been really, really harmed by years of people sitting on them, moving the pews around. And we thought, we've got to come up with a solution that's better than this. So we came up with the locking casters and we came up with the idea that we were going to have to hire a contractor who had wonderful woodworking skills. So we um, had a wonderful way of doing this. And one of the things that I'm going to keep pushing us over this next time that we like are coming up with making spaces is that we no longer need to be a do it yourself community. I think one of the most important things um, for us as as a people is that we start doing things together, the DIT culture. And so I knew that as I was coming up with these ideas, my idea was that I was going to put all of the casters on it here and I was going to fix all of the pews. I don't have the skill sets that would make that possible to do very quickly. And so quickly, I was able to get someone from our community, um, one of the parishioners who is incredible. He contacted a bunch of different contractors. Most didn't call us back when we were like, hey, can you put a bunch of casters on 100 year old pews or close to 100 year old pews and then can you just like fix the center part and here's our budget they're like that's no thanks so he was able to find someone don an incredibly skilled guy fix the center for us and then he put all the casters on but as you guys know i am meticulous when it comes to making sure that you kind of can't see the modern um, or it, it's not glaring or, or too obvious. And so when we first looked at these casters, they had silver and white um, wheel liners. And I thought this isn't gonna work. And so we were able to spray them and make them match. But it was really important again that we have participation from other folks in this process. Why am I telling you all of this? Because if you're trying to figure out how, whether it be because we're coming like back from um, being in isolation in or having to shelter at home, and you're trying to figure out like, how are we going to do seating and we have pews and our pews aren't mobile, or maybe you're thinking maybe the space should be used for more than one thing, you've got to start thinking about how to make things like pews mobile. And this might be an option for you. And even if it isn't an option for you, my hope is by showing you the process of all of this, that you'll figure out ways that maybe something like this, or even the process that we went through to get to this, because it was a process. We started out with me having this crazy idea of we should be able to move the pews. Some folks coming up with we should cut the pews in half, meeting with different contractors, most of us thinking we were crazy, and then coming back together and coming up with a solution. And then different people volunteering to do different parts within their skill set. When we work together, the most incredible things can happen. And so eventually we did. We were able to get all the casters on the pews. We were able to fix all the centers. And our first Sunday, everybody faced each other once we had the casters on. And I got to tell you, it was incredible. Because once it was locked down, just like any chair, people often wonder like, oh, uh, is it like less stable than the pews before? The truth is no, because you know we don't flip over chairs when we sit down them, and people don't flip over pews. The pews are quite heavy, um, and they're super stable now, and we're able to move them. But they're able to be moved by people who don't even have a heck of a lot of strength, because once you lock them down, they're able to be moved. And that first Sunday when everyone was looking at each other, it was incredible. I was wondering what kind of the response was going to be, and a woman who had been in her 90s. Well, she was in her 90s. Uh, a woman in her 90s came up and said to me, I absolutely love it. Please don't ever put the pews back the way they were. Now we do. Whenever we have weddings that are super formal, we'll put all the pews back facing the way they were. And then the next Sunday, we're able to, with just a few people, move them back into the way that they were. Now we still have to figure out what to do with all the extra pews because we got to figure out where we're going to store them. Again, we have no space, but this has been an incredible thing for us. And our church has grown. And I think part of it is, is that people feel a connection when they can look at each other and see each other. The other reason I think it's so important for us to think about maybe doing church in the round 
is that there's this thing called death of an expert. Even in our classrooms, kids can Google things. We can look things up. For me as a preacher, you can hear a way better sermon than mine just through a podcast or whatever it might be. So people shouldn't just be gathering to hear a good speaker or to have an, they want to experience each other and community. And I think that's going to be so important as we move forward, even as we come out of sheltering in place. And so part of that, as we kind of have the death of the expert, as people aren't coming to church to hear me tell them the thing that they need to hear necessarily, they're coming because they want an experience they're going to need to want to encounter each other. And that's going to look differently as we think about how do you have six feet in all directions for folks? How do we build space? And so this is just a creative way to think through it, but I didn't do it on my own. And so I interviewed a couple that I just adore um, that helped with this process. And I feel a little bit like I'm the person who's like constantly just, hey, what do you think about this? And next thing you know, people are volunteering to help out and it becomes a do it together project. Um, And so you're going to hear from a wonderful couple, Carol and Anita, as they share what for them um, this process was like, because they actually ended up painting all of those wheel wells I was telling you about earlier, because I didn't want the wheels to stick out every Sunday. I wanted people to just sort of be able to look at each other and not notice this super modern thing attached to this super older thing. Again, there's always this beautiful merging of the ancient and the modern um, when we're trying to be just faithful to the process of being intergenerational. So this space was transformed and it has now been used for things like an amazing conversation about racial reconciliation happened in there and people were able to face each other and have really tough conversation in a way that they can't have if they're just facing forward or listening to me. It is a challenge sometimes to preach in the round, but I think it's worth it. I also think it's incredible to be able to offer just different variations of uh, spatial use now. And hopefully as we um, move out of sheltering in place, the space will be used for so many other community things because we've thought through how to make it a space that is just multi-purpose. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'm so easy to find. Rev Sarah Heath um, is like my name on everything. So Instagram, Rev Sarah Heath on, um, it's a website, RevSarahHeath.com. I would love to hear from you, hear your feedback, leave comments, subscribe. That would be really helpful for us. Um, Let me know if the sound was terrible. Um, Again, I'm just so grateful for all of those who are part of the process and also for those of you who are following the journey. So thanks so much. We're going to hear a quick word from the sponsors that make the Making Spaces podcast possible. And then after that, we're going to hear from Anita and Carol, a couple who have been incredible at helping all these kind of crazy dreams that I have become reality. They have been incredible volunteers and friends, and they have a lot of great words and wisdom. I just wanted to talk to you guys really quickly about... um, well, about how I always seem to make you guys help me around the church. So <laughs> I thought it would be fun because I'm going to do um, an episode a month on my podcast about um, like actual practical things we've done. And so since you guys have been my partners in crime several times um, as we try to do it together, um, <laughs> I wanted to talk <laughs> to you about the Pew Project, um, which, you know, basically was you know, four years in the making of trying to figure out how the heck to deal with those big, huge pews. And we came up with this caster system and then had to hire a contractor to fix the center of the pews. And then he ended up putting all the casters on because you guys, do you remember that I wanted to do it myself? Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) And I was, I was willing to help you, but there were some others who didn't think we could do it. I know. Now I'm actually probably pretty grateful that I'm more it. than grateful that we didn't have to <laughs> screw all of those casters in. Although we did do, I did do one, so I know it's possible, but it would take a really long time. But we discovered uh, in the midst of that, that the pews, uh, the casters had um, silver mm-hmm. in the wheel well. Mm-hmm. And you guys were so kind and painted all of them for me. <laughs> that was so much fun. I feel like I hear sarcasm in that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can't see us, so you'll never know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anita and Carol, how long have you guys been married? 35 years. Yes. 35 years. So have you done projects like this before? Oh, yes. Carol is the creative genius of the family who thinks of projects and then 
Anita looks, helps refine them. <laughs> looks up how to do them and presents the idea to me and then after a while says, and if you'll just paint or sand and paint, <laughs> then they'll be complete. So you're kind of used to someone like me who has this grand idea and then kind of likes to get everyone involved. Yes. See, I have prepared Anita for you. There you go. <laughs> and it's, it's really a lot of fun because you get to go from idea to the creative process and problem solving and the final result, which has always turned out really wonderful. It's true. We've done stairs together, although we did pull in an expert for that one. We have done office floors and we learned what kind of sanders to use and not use. <laughs> um, we've done these casters, which when you think about it, the project, when I first said I want to put wheels on the pews, what did you guys think? That you were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you thought, why did you think I was crazy? Well, mainly because I've, I've never ever thought of doing that before. But I also have not been at a church that has moved the pews around like we do. Mm. And so you had a vision of how you could restructure that room. For me, coming into the church, it was always set up the way traditional churches are set up. And so I didn't have any real expectation of that changing. So I didn't really understand why you wanted to do something that I thought probably was going to take a lot of work. Now, it makes complete sense to me. Um, I just didn't have that, that vision ahead of time. Yeah, it's kind of a, when I tried to explain it to people, I think when I first got there, everyone thought, well, she wants to use this room as a multi-purpose room, so she's going to get rid of the pews. Um, but that was actually cost prohibitive because we looked at the cost of chairs, although I also have to admit to just those wood pews are just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of just getting rid of them felt really not good either because um, I think we've really tried to include the folks that kind of came from like the, the traditional church in the look of it and we also host a lot of weddings and I knew that the, the pews were kind of a selling feature, but the fact that we needed to be able to like face each other seemed important. So I'll just never forget telling you guys, I've got this idea and then tried to explain it to everyone. And everyone looked at me like I was crazy. Um, but I think some of the older folks were like, that sounds great because they thought I was going to cut the pews in half, which at one point was a thought of mine, but I still was going to put casters on them. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to the point of, putting the casters on and they have silver like wheel wells. And so we decide to paint them all black. And by, I mean, we decide, I thought we'll just do that. And we, the contractor that we worked with to, um, who ended up putting all the pew, uh, casters on and fixing the middle parts. He, um, was like, I can't, you know, also do this. It's going to take me forever. And, you know, the three of us were outside. I don't know. We were spray painting something else. What else were we working on at that point? Oh, I think we were working on hinges for, um, for the other room where wedding parties. Right. Uh, meet. Yeah. Yeah. I just did a video, uh, montage of those things trying to help. Cause I feel like even as I try to like describe things, <laughs> everyone looks at me like I'm crazy until they can see it. I think that's part of like, maybe you feel this way a little bit, Carol, but like I have these ideas in my head that I want to bring to life, but uh, other people can't necessarily see them yet. So I did a video of us doing the um, closets because I think that's an important transition that happened as well. Cause that ended up being a really nice usable space when it was kind of a point of let's hide that room. It was like the, almost the junk room of the church. And now it's the, you know, wedding room or the lounge as we call it. Um, and it's a really cool room, but so we went outside, he was flipping out about it and we decided, and by we, I mean, you guys volunteered to paint all of those casters. And actually to be more specific, it was Anita who said, Oh, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> because I had experience painting Carol's mini projects. It really, it wasn't difficult. It was time consuming, but I don't know that you can really 
measure the time when you're looking at doing something unique like that. You just have to have the vision which you have and then go towards that vision. And it always takes longer than you Mm -hmm. think it's going to, huh? Yes. I think, though, that one of the things that's important about that is when you're working with people. And so for Nina and I, we've worked together on a lot of projects. And we did that in our professional career, not that kind of work. But we've done a lot of coordinating. So for us, it's, you know, we got we got a pattern down. We kind of figured out what our individual jobs were going to be. And we were able to move through it, I think, much faster as a, a result of that. So um, we just kind of had to work out the plan initially and then, and then just kind of keep going with it. But the vision is the first step. Yeah. And I think it's important not to discount that vision and just say it's too hard or it'll take too long or um, there's no way, um, rather than discount it, to really look at um, if we pull together all of our people and our resources, I bet we can do that. Yeah, it's this odd. I think a lot of communities, whether churches or nonprofits, um, assume that they always have to hire a professional because sometimes, you know, projects have been done at not such a great level by nonprofessionals who are doing their best. Um, but I think people always think that they don't have the giftings in their community already. And so one of the things I love about this work is that it has been fun to find out like the various random skills people have. Um, you two as a team has been amazing. Um, I think about like even the podiums that you built because Carol can do woodwork and Anita can match, uh, stain, which is a unique skill. Um, so it's been so fun to do. Now, how do you feel like people have reacted to the pews? Cause everyone tells me it's great, but I feel like everyone would tell me it was great. That's not true. People would tell me if they hated something, they're not afraid to do that. But what do you guys think is the biggest thing about how do you feel like people feel about it? And then what do you think when you think about them? I think that um, the, first walking in and seeing the, if you talk about the configuration, seeing the pews face each other, finding a place to sit, that's so di- you know, it's different. So you have to make that adjustment. But once you do, I think it's very cool to be able to see people, um, to connect with people in that way. And um, I, I think that it really kind of unites community a little bit better than sitting with somebody's back to you. Yeah, it does kind of have that like, um, yeah, it has like a community making aspect to it, which is crazy when you think about the idea that, oh yeah, this is just the movement of chairs. And, um, you know, we have to think through that more even now as we start talking about regathering after the pandemic what is that going to look like how are we going to be mobile and able to move you know to be able to face each other if we can't be close to each other you know having six feet in all directions will be really hard in a space if you're not able to adjust the space and I think the we've been able to make a space that was incredibly beautiful even more beautiful and perhaps even more useful which is always a always a benefit so but I think it's you know it's not common to come into well into a church setting um, and certainly other places as well when you gather in large groups like that to actually face each other Mm -hmm. and so I think the first time that we walked in that you had the pews arranged that way it's like oh well this is really different Um, because there is a certain amount of you can kind of not be anonymous when you're sitting behind people, but you can, you can, you know, choose to be sort of in the back when you're all sort of in a circle. It's kind of hard to get to the back. (laughs) Yeah. So there is no back. (laughs) It creates, it creates a different dynamic, I think in the room and in terms of even the interactions, but also, you know, sometimes when we're, we're all facing forward, you might refer to somebody and look at them, but I can't really see who that is. And it's, it's Mm. kind of allowed me to even, get to know, put names with faces, um, and you you just automatically end up having more eye contact with each other. And I think that 
also helps with relationships. And don't you think that if you think about it from your vision of community and establishing the church as a, um, you know, as an entity or um, hallmark in the community that really represents that, um, this seems to me like it's part of that vision. It's just another Mm. step toward that vision of pulling people together in a community, which is what I think most people really want in their church is to feel that connection. Yeah, I hope so. I I think that um, sometimes we've missed out on that. Sometimes we haven't quite got that, you know, totally right in that um, people have felt a sense like, um, I'm not welcome here or this isn't for me. And sometimes actually really traditional churches can be one of the, like it can almost be a problem for folks who are giving church a try for the first time or maybe trying again. Like they come into a space that's just so um, fancy and they feel like, wait a minute, this isn't for me. Um, and so I think that's a, that's another thing that um, I hope people have felt like we've done a good job of kind of making it accessible, making um, the space accessible that might not have been accessible. And part of that is how the, you know, how the pews face each other. On a previous episode, I talked to a designer and he said, you know, having people face you as you walk in actually makes you feel more drawn into the space versus if you walk into the back of a bunch of people. And I, I think, you know, that's often the experience of people coming into the church for the first, you know, into a church for the first time is that they feel the backs of people and not necessarily the faces of people. Or like you say, I point someone out and then you guys are like, who are they talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. makes it sound like I call people out mid service. Hey, you (laughs) over there. It's kind of like a stand up comedy moment. I just like, (laughs) I see you polka dots. And I'm just kidding. That's not true. I don't do that. Um, (laughs) If you could kind of just you know, give a little sense of when you think about the design of spaces, what do you think is important to make people feel welcome? Um, Because both of you have been involved in, you know, um, well, higher education settings, you've been involved in um, social work settings, you've been involved in multiple church settings, you've lived in different places. So if you had to think through what was sort of an element that made a space feel welcoming, what would you, what would you say? I think it's the connection to people and having a space structured so that that really works. Yeah. You know, I, I, what I flashed on when you said that was, and this is a little bit different, but it, it, it fits for me is it is the dynamic that you set up in terms of, um, you know, what makes people feel welcome and and those kinds of things. But I had a student one time who was a a full-time social worker with uh, Department of Children and Family Services, and she used to run these meetings where the family would come in, the lawyers would come in, the social workers, and she would have this whole team of people. One of the things that she would do is before they would all arrive, particularly the family, she would go into whatever room they were meeting in, and she would completely clean it. And she would set it up in a way as best she could in an office kind of setting. Um, something that made it feel comfortable. Mm. And she would bring in food and, and she would try and kind of make the environment warm. But her, her message to me about why she did that was she believed that, that she was conveying a message to... Um, those that were coming into the meeting, that you are important enough for me to make this as special a place as I can for this incredibly important and emotional meeting. Mm. And I think that, you know, whether we're talking about something like that or, I mean, when our, when our goal is to draw people in, um, to make them feel welcome, it's about thinking about all those different kinds of things that make it comfortable and that communicate the message that, we care enough about you that we also care about the space that we ask you to come and join us in. Oh, I love that. And to add to that, I think that oftentimes church is the refuge for many people who have been disconnected in other places in their life. And we certainly know that there are churches who have rejected people. So when you have a church that 
that is opened up to individuals, um, is affirming to individuals, um, the space, the way the space looks, really helps to build their own self-worth in that you're important enough for us to offer you a safe refuge in, an, in a room that is clean, as Carol described, that same kind of concept, you know, where, where um, we provided this safe space for you that's warm and comfortable and connecting so that we can show that we love you. And that's revolutionary sometimes, and we don't even realize what our nonverbal cues are saying. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been, it's been so wonderful to work with you guys on thinking through those things. And um, will you work on projects with me again? Of course. But you'll set more time apart, huh? I think, <laughs> how many times do you guys think we went to Home Depot working on the office oh. project? <laughs> about probably five or six and uh you know but that's the other part of that is that you know when you're doing projects together with people um you're creating memories yeah and i think that that's you know that's kind of a mantra that Anita and i have had throughout our our life together is our goal is to create memories together and i, love I that. think that to do that with you know with your significant other um, with your family, your kids, with your friends, um, with your, you know, your different communities that you're involved with. That's, that's really what we take with us are all the memories. And so, you know, I, I have a number of memories, um, connected to doing the floors upstairs in the office, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and most of them I, I laugh about, um, you know, and when we were doing our office floors here at home, where were you? No, you I know. Here. Well, <laughs> but you were quarantined. You were in quarantine. I was in quarantine. fairness, you were Otherwise, quarantined. I would have come and hung out with you guys. <laughs> I know you would have. <laughs> but you know that actually <laughs> that inspired Anita to. She's been thinking about this for a long time. That just kind of moved it along. Yeah, you inspired me to do that. And oh, yet, good. it's beautiful. I mean, I'm so glad that we did it. Um, and and as I said, it's all about it's all about memories. Well, I am so glad that you guys have uh, joined me in my projects. Um, I'm sure that I'll pull you in on a conversation again because I'm sure I'll ask you to do something. And <laughs> thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening to this first ever Makers episode. It was definitely a experiment and I hope it worked and let us know. And again, it came from the questions that people asked. The number one thing people asked about was putting casters on the pews. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out. And now for this week's inspirational quote. I can do things you cannot. You can do things I cannot. Together, we can do great things. And that's from Mother Teresa. Making Spaces is edited by Stephen Burnett from The Cult Podcast. The introduction music is It Can Be Done by Ari via Epidemic Sound. If you like this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And leave us a review. It helps other listeners find us and let us know that we're on the right track. <laughs>